Build by Tony Fidel. This summary is brought to you by Hook My Book. This is a biography of a Nest founder, Tony Fidel, a successful businessperson who has been through a lot of trials and tribulations in his career. He shares the advice learned from his many mentors and experiences throughout his career. This is a story of how his life has swung between great success and great failure, and how each time he has learned from his mistakes and started from scratch. In 1978, when the author was in third grade, he started a company selling eggs door-to-door. -door. In 1980, the author discovered his life's work when he took a programming class in fifth grade and founded Quality Computers. In 1986, he founded ASIC Enterprises, a mail-order company reselling third-party Apple hardware. In 1990, he founded Constructive Instruments, a multimedia editor for kids, and in 1991, he started working for General Magic. The year 2000 was the worst year for him. Later he started working for Apple. Then, he founded Nest Labs which was bought by Google for $3.2 billion. Now, he mentors and supports around 200 startups full-time. Build yourself. Mark Porat, a former Apple employee, drew this sketch of the Pocket Crystal in 1989. The Pocket Crystal was a touchscreen mobile computer that combined a cell phone and fax machine that let you play games and watch movies and buy plane tickets from anywhere. However, the Pocket Crystal was insanely prophetic because it was released in 1989, when few people owned cell phones, the web didn't exist, and mobile gaming meant carrying a Nintendo console to your friend's house. After years of work, General Magic imploded and failed. However, the author and Mark Porat learned a lot of valuable lessons during the process, such as the fact that you need to try and fail in order to learn and succeed. The author worked at General Magic for four years and then realized that the company was not solving real people's problems. So, the author recommends looking for a place where you can work as hard as you can to learn as much as you can from people who can make something great. So even if the experience kicks your ass, the force of that kick will propel you into a new stage of your life. And you'll figure out what to do next. Do real work. Companies that are starting revolutions often have certain characteristics. They are creating something entirely new or combining existing technology in a novel way that the competition can't copy or understand. They solve a problem that a lot of people experience, and there is an existing large market for the product. Leadership is not dogmatic about the solution, and they are willing to adapt to their customers' needs. The company is also thinking about the problem in a way that is new but makes perfect sense once it is explained. Steve Jobs once said that management consulting is, like a picture of a banana, you might get a very accurate picture but it's only two dimensions. Jobs went on to say that without the experience of actually doing it, you never get three dimensions and you'll never really taste it. In other words, if you want to be successful in management consulting, like the big four, you need to be passionate about the industry and willing to do the work. If you fall in love with the wrong thing, you might end up unhappy and unsuccessful. Search for your heroes and work with them. People often focus on what they can't control when looking for a job, such as money, perks, and titles, but it's important to remember that the people who make a job great are the ones you respect. Focus on understanding your field and using that knowledge to create connections with the best of the best, people you truly respect. When you work with legends and heroes, you realize that they are not infallible and that they can be geniuses in one area and clueless in another. They can be proud and proud of your work, but they can also help you, catch things you miss, and build a relationship based on mutual respect. And the best part is that helping your hero feels amazing. Data versus Opinion Every decision you make has elements of data and opinion. Data-driven decisions are easy to make and defend, and most people can agree on the answer. Opinion-driven decisions are always hard and always questioned, and without adequate data, you can't make a decision. You need insights to inform your opinion, and you can get outside input to help you form a gut instinct. The author explains how a product launch goes when it is new. At first, there is no comparison to be made, 
as there is no other product like it on the market. Accordingly, the team must define their target customer clearly, talk to them, and find out what their problems are. From this information, the team should then figure out how to best fix these problems. This process can be difficult and take time, but it is ultimately the job of the leader to trust their gut, explain their thought process, and allow the team to make decisions. If the team does not agree with the leader, they should be respectful and speak up. Assholes An asshole is a person who is selfish, deceitful, or cruel, and you can't trust them. They will screw you and or your team over. There are three types of assholes, political assholes, controlling assholes, and mission-driven assholes. The mission-driven assholes are the most difficult to work with because they are crazy passionate and always try to make the work better. Much like true assholes, they are neither easygoing nor easy to work with. Unlike true assholes, they care. They give a damn. They listen. They work incredibly hard and push their team to be better, often against their will. They are unrelenting when they know they're right, but are open to changing their minds and will praise other people's efforts if they're genuinely great. Build your product. The author discusses the importance of designing a product that is not just a physical object, but also takes into account the user's entire experience, beginning before they even touch the product and ending after they have finished using it. The author argues that it is important to prototype as much of the user's experience as possible in order to avoid overlooking the less flashy but important parts of the product's journey. You should be able to map out and visualize exactly how a customer discovers, considers, installs, uses, fixes, and even returns your product. It all matters. The customer journey begins with awareness, the advertisement, website, etc., acquisition, the installation process, and usage, how the customer interacts with the product. There are bumps in between, but the customer always asks, why, which leads to the cycle of customer retention. Remember, when a company gives that kind of care and attention to every part of the journey, people notice. A product story should appeal to people's rational and emotional sides, take complicated concepts and make them simple, and remind people of the problem that the product is meant to solve. In order to compete and gain a mind share over your competitors, you must tell stories that resonate with your target audience. This can be done by empathizing with their concerns or showing them how your product will change their lives for the better. Quick stories are easy to remember. And, more importantly, easy to repeat. Someone else telling your story will always reach more people and do more to convince them to buy your product than any amount of talking you do about yourself on your platforms. You should always be striving to tell a story so good that it stops being yours, so your customer learns it, loves it, internalizes it, owns it, and tells it to everyone they know. Disruption and Execution Evolution is the process of making something better, while disruption is a new approach to an old problem that changes the status quo. Execution is the actual doing of what you've promised to do, and it's important to do it well. In order to be successful, you need to find the right balance between being disruptive and executing well. If you're not able to execute, your competitors will be able to easily beat you. A disruptive company must be prepared for strong reactions and stronger emotions from its customers and employees. Disruptions make enemies, and starting something new in a big company won't protect you. Disruptions are scary, especially to people who think they have mastered their domain and who are completely unprepared for the ground to shift under their feet. All it takes to start a landslide is one big scary new thing. When starting a new product or project, it is important to have a strong vision and customer insights in order to move forward. However, it is also important to have data to help make decisions. Once you have experience with the product, you can rely on customer insights and data to help make decisions. However, it is important to always keep in mind your original vision and not forget why you are doing this in the first place. Patience and Profits The joke is that it takes 20 years to make an overnight success in business. It always takes longer than you think to find a product-slash-market fit, get your customers' attention, 
build a complete solution, and then make money. You typically need to create at least three generations of any new, disruptive product before you get it right and turn a profit. No matter what you're building, reaching profitability will take longer than you think. You will almost certainly not make any money with V1. You'll need to reinvent yourself at least three times. Sometimes many more. That can take just as long for an app or service as it does for a hardware launch. It takes time to evolve and change, to react to customer feedback, and to make every point on the customer journey as strong as the product itself. And customers still need time to learn about you, to try your product, to decide it's worth it. They need time to march up the adoption curve. That's how it went with all the current giants of tech, Google and Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. Google wasn't remotely profitable for a long time. They only started making real money when they figured out AdWords. Facebook decided to capture eyeballs, and then figure out the business model later. So did Pinterest and Twitter. They created a V1 product, scaled it for V2, and then optimized the business in V3. The author discusses how companies go through different stages and how early adopters should have realistic expectations. He also explains that it is very hard to predict the future and that many Kickstarter projects fail because people think that if they can make a product for $50 and sell it for $200, then their company will be a success. That $150 profit gets sucked away with every new office chair and dependent on your employee's insurance, with every customer support call and Instagram ad. Until you optimize the business, not just the product, you can never build something lasting. You make the product. You fix the product. You build the business. Repeat this several times. Every product. Every company. Every time. How to find a great idea. An idea is based on three key elements, why, problem, and chase. Before anything else, you need to understand why people would need or want the product or service. You also need to identify a problem that a lot of people face, and figure out how to address it. Finally, you need to make the idea tangible and interesting enough to keep you interested, so it will chase you around. The best ideas come from painkillers, not vitamins. Painkillers eliminate something that's constantly bothering you and the best pain is one you experience in your own life. Most startups are born from people getting so frustrated with something in their daily experience. Not every product idea has to come from your own life, but the why always has to be crisp and easy to articulate. You have to be able to easily, clearly, and persuasively explain why people will need it. That's the only way to understand what features it should have, whether the timing is right for it to exist, and whether the market for it will be tiny or enormous. Once you have a strong why, you have the germ of a great idea. But you can't build a business on a germ. First, you have to figure out if this idea is strong enough to carry a company. You need to build a business and implementation plan. And you have to understand if it's something you want to work on for the next 5 to 10 years of your life. Are you ready? Entrepreneurship is the process of starting and running a business. It can be a very difficult process, but it can also be very rewarding. There are many things that successful entrepreneurs have in common such as taking risks, being able to work hard, and having a strong dedication to their work. However, there is no one path to entrepreneurship, and it takes many years of trial and error to get to the point where you are successful. Even if you have a brilliant idea for a world-changing product, when you're starting a business, you need to run that business. Making something new is hard enough, the unknown unknowns that keep you up at night should be focused on the problem you're trying to solve, not on whether to get a marketing agency or what kind of lawyer to hire. You won't have time to screw up the basics, to waste time learning the fundamentals. Starting a company is extremely hard work, and you need a partner who can help you balance out. You need to be careful not to overload your co-founder, as this can lead to trouble. You need a team of people who are passionate about what you're doing, and who you can trust to help you reach your goals. Raising Capital Capital is important, it can help you start a business and grow it. 
However, when you raise capital, you have to be careful because it is a long-term commitment. You should also think about who you are partnering with and make sure they are a good fit for you. You also have to make sure that the company and the investment are a good fit for both parties. VCs exist to help startups raise money, and they do this by exchanging money for equity in the company. A VC's job is to help the startup by vetting the idea, finding a qualified team, and helping the company reach their growth goals. It's not always easy, but with hard work, a little luck, and a lot of relationships, a startup can succeed. VCs expect a high return on investment, ROI, very quickly, which is not always realistic for startups. There are many different sources of capital, and it is important to find a partner who will be supportive and helpful along the way. Remember, once you take money from an investor, you're stuck with them. And the balance of power shifts. A VC can fire a founder, but a founder can't fire their VC. You can't divorce them for irreconcilable differences. And if things go south, you can end up in an estranged marriage, still legally tied together, but never speaking. When a VC writes off your company, they basically ignore you. Won't help you. Won't connect you to other VCs won't speak up for your partners. They'll stand on the sidelines as your company goes bankrupt. When pitching your business to investors, be honest, keep your vision and why intact, and be clear about what you need and how you plan to spend the money raised. Remember that investors want to see that you have skin in the game, and that you're willing to revest shares you've already received. Make sure you have references and that you're transparent about your risks and ways to mitigate them. Finally, get two similarly influential investors to balance each other out. Focus on the main customer. Essentially, businesses should focus on serving one main customer, and everything else should be shaped around that customer. If a business focuses too much on serving consumers instead of focusing on its main customer, it can run into a lot of trouble. When you're in a crisis, you will focus on fixing the problem, not on who is to blame. You will communicate with your team and others in order to keep everyone updated and calm. You will also apologize for any damage that has been done and try to fix it. At the start, focus on your one task. An individual contributor usually works on a project that is due in a short amount of time or that is one step on a longer project. They are responsible for the details of the project and depend on their managers and executive team to set a destination and lay out a path. If an individual contributor is constantly looking down, they may walk into a brick wall. The details of the project right in front of them are crystal clear, but the farther they look out, the fuzzier everything becomes. In the early stages of your career, that is the way it should be. You should be focused on getting your specific piece of each project done, done well, and out the door. New perspectives are everywhere. The author tells the story of how, when he was working on a project at his old job, he realized that he didn't understand the perspective of the people working on the project, and he took the opportunity to talk to them and learn more. He also started listening to marketing and support staff, and found that they had different perspectives on the project that he hadn't considered. This led him to realize that he needed to be more open to new perspectives and be willing to change his goals in order to work better with his team. Be a good manager. A manager is someone who helps a team of people work together to produce high-quality work. A manager must be able to communicate effectively and be able to set clear goals for their team. Managers must also be honest with their team and be willing to let them know when things need to change. A manager is someone who is in charge of a team of people and helps them to be successful. A first-time manager has no experience managing, so they have to learn how to do it. The first thing a manager has to do is to understand how to lead a team. Managers must also be able to manage their time and be able to focus on the work that they are responsible for. If you're a good manager and build a good team, that team will blast off. So lean into it. Cheer them on when they get promoted. Glow with pride when they kick ass at a board meeting or present their work to the entire company. That's how you become a good manager. That's how you start to love the job. Quit. Stick to itiveness is important, 
and if you're passionate about your project, you'll likely need to doggedly pursue it even if it means earning less money or staying at a problematic company. However, sometimes you just need to quit, and you'll know if you're ready to do that by either, 1, no longer be passionate about the mission, or, 2, having tried everything and still being unable to get the project done. When you're ready to quit, make sure you do so in a graceful way, by giving notice and ending your relationship with the company in a way that preserves as much of what you've accomplished as possible. If you're unhappy with the direction of your project, or the company itself, you should try to get the attention of leadership, either through regular meetings or by presenting thoughtful, insightful solutions to the problems. If you're successful, you may be rewarded with a promotion or a better job. If not, you may still be able to stay with the company, but you'll need to be prepared to be persistent and professional. End of the summary. Thanks for listening.